Okay. All right, so we're recording. Um, today I wanted to, I had every intention of giving you oops, a study sheet. Or, wow, that was one puzzle. Um, I had every intention of giving you a study sheet for the test, which is next Wednesday. Didn't get around to writing that this morning because of a meeting that went a little longer than I had hoped, and then people showing up for office hours, which is also a good thing, because you need to study anyway. But the test basically covers um, sections chapter one and then chapter two. So that's pretty much it. Uh, that study sheet, study thing that I'm going to be giving you is also an assignment on WebAssign that you'll see popping up. It's not going to be worth any homework credit, but it's going to give you some credit for your test. If that makes any sense. So I'm going to give you a homework assignment that's not homework, but it'll add value to your test score. So if you don't do it, that's fine. You don't need to do it. You can still get a 100% on the test, even if you don't do it. But if you do it, then not only will you be studying, you'll also be earning a little credit for your test. Okay, so that's going to go up here shortly. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're going to today do one point, sorry, 2.6. I introduced that last time. And we have just a little bit left to cover today. And Friday, we might have to run into Monday to finish it all. Uh, we also were about one section behind, but Monday was supposed to be review day. Um, we need to get through 2.8. Two point seven is not very long, so we might be able to smash that into one day and then finish up Monday a little bit early on two point eight, and then continue from there. Uh, so that's the next couple days. Due tomorrow is homework. Two point three, two point five, two point six. We'll have a quiz Friday with those sections. Um, so we've got that coming. Next week Friday, there's no quiz. On weeks where there's a test, we're not going to have a quiz. Um, so there's no quiz next week. Just a reminder, uh, if you are going to miss a class day, if it's Monday or Wednesday and there's no test on those days, really, like, you can, you can send me an email and say, sorry, I didn't make it. I'm going to watch the lecture online. So, like, that's totally appropriate. Uh, you, you're not required to be in class. On those days when there's a test or a quiz, please do send me an email saying I'm not going to be there. And then also include, like, the reason. Right? And then also, if it's like one of those excusable instances, just give me a little bit of context for like why you're excused from, from that day. Because that's, that excuse is what I need to say, yes, you can make up the test. Yes, you can make up the quiz. Okay. Um, without a good excuse, and we talked about that at the beginning of the year, um, without a good excuse, please come to class and take your tests or take your quizzes. Okay. Okay. Um, and it goes without saying, I hope, if you're sick, please don't come to class. Okay. And then just go to student health services when you're feeling up to it. And the doctor there will say, yes, okay, here, let me give you this note. And then you send me a picture of that. That's perfect. Okay. Don't come to class if you're feeling ill. Uh, I just had some students ask if, um, you know, is it okay that I don't come to class? I don't feel very well. Yes, please don't come to class if you don't feel well. Okay. Um, are there questions about what we're going to be doing or what we're doing? Okay. So, 2.6. Limits at infinity. I introduced these last time, and uh, today I sort of gave to another student this intuition of leveling off. So I think that might be a good place to start, and I'll give you, uh, I gave you this example last time of 1 over x, and if we look at, as x gets really big in this function, 
you know, we plug in one, we get a value of one. We plug in one half, we, we get a value of two. If we plug in 10, we get a value of one tenth. Plug in 100, we get one one hundredth. So this function, as you plug in bigger and bigger things, sort of levels, quote, levels off. Right? It, it will eventually just sort of flatten out. And it will flatten out at a specific height. This one, it flattens off, or levels out, or flat, the levels off, or flattens out at a height of zero. So that's what we do, that's what we called this infinite limit last time. And that's what it means when we write this. We're essentially saying this function, 1 over x, levels off when x gets huge at a height of zero. And we also have this other case where on the left hand side, if we plugged in negative one, we got negative one. If we plug in negative one half, just for a little more, we got negative two. Negative 10 gives us negative one tenth. Negative 100, which is way over here, is even closer to the axis, but underneath. So from on this side, as we make x go to negative infinity, This function levels off. It looks like it's sort of flattening out at a height of zero. Okay. These values give us something called horizontal asymptotes. I've used this word before. The line, which is a flat line, a horizontal line, at a height of zero, which is the x-axis, this is a horizontal asymptote of this function 1 over x. Okay? We can find this equation by taking this positive limit so we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. And by taking this negative limit, which means we have another horizontal asymptote at 0, they happen to be the same, so it's great. This process of taking a function's limit at positive infinity to find one of them, and taking the limit at negative infinity to find the other, is how you can find horizontal asymptotes of a function. Okay, and these things, just like uh, I was telling the student these, these equations are basically found by looking at where the function levels off in big air quotes there. So let me give you uh, another example, which is similar to this one, and I'll ask you a conceptual question. So what if I take a piecewise function? So for anything bigger than zero, we have the exact same thing. For anything less than zero, we're going to just subtract 1 from that same thing. How can I find the horizontal asymptotes of this function? I do two things. You take the limit as x goes to infinity of your function. You take the limit as x goes to negative infinity of your function. If these are constants, you have yourself a horizontal asymptote. So this one, we know. For positive numbers, we just have this function, which means we know this. This is just 0. Here's the graph it levels off at a height of zero as you go further and further in that direction. For negatives, so negative infinities, right? Oops. Okay, I have to correct that. There we go. Before I had a piecewise function defined twice, two different rules for the same set of numbers. I meant to say these were the non-negatives and these were the negatives. Okay. 
Are you, with, are you with me? It's a small error. I hope it didn't confuse anyone. I hadn't quite gotten it yet. So, okay. So this is what we have for negatives. We're taking a negative infinite limit here, so we're working here with this rule. What does it look like compared to this one? Let's just move down a little bit. Can you guess what it levels off at? Negative one. Very good. If this one leveled off at zero, and I just move it down a little by one, well then this one's going to level off at negative one. Okay. These are constant, which means there's these horizontal lines, right? These two horizontal lines I've drawn in that our function levels off at. Two horizontal lines are what we call horizontal asymptotes. There's all sorts of functions that have horizontal asymptotes, and there's all sorts of functions that don't have horizontal asymptotes. Uh, the simplest function you know of, which is a constant, is a horizontal asymptote. The second simplest function you have, which is a line with some non-zero slope, has no horizontal asymptotes. You take the positive limit at infinity, you get infinity if it's a positive slope. You get negative infinity if it's a negative slope. So no horizontal asymptotes for the second simplest function, which is just a line. So my conceptual question for you is, how many horizontal asymptotes are possible for a given function. If I just gave you a random function, how many horizontal asymptotes might you expect to find? like a list of possible numbers of them. You can't have a negative number of horizontal asymptotes. We're going to rule that one out. Could you have zero horizontal asymptotes? I just gave you an example. It's a you could have zero. For example, lines have no constant uh, plus or minus infinity limits. Right, you take the positive limit. Let's just take any line, 2x. And what do you get? Well, x is going to infinity. Well, then this is twice infinity, so this is definitely infinity. That's not a constant. Negative infinity is the same thing. Can we have one horizontal asymptote? Yes, 1 over x has 1. Any more question? Um, yes. Can you redefine what a constant is? A number. Okay. A, 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 a single number. Okay. Yeah. It never changes. So in other words, there's no variable. Like this, that's not a variable. Okay. But if the limit was like, uh, okay, so you're not there yet, right? We're in top one. What if I had two variables in here and I took the limit as one of them goes to something? It is entirely possible, for example, do this over here so it's not on video. So if we take like the limit of x going to 
infinity of y, which is a variable that does not depend on x, <coughs> of times 1 over x. Uh, this is that one. That's a good one. We know this thing goes to a limit of negative 1. This thing doesn't depend on x, so it stays what it is. That's not a constant, because that's a variable, which can change. Okay. And we can have two, I think, as well. We know that one from this very example that we just showed. Can we have more than two horizontal asymptotes? I see it now. Why not? Um, because you can have one going in the positive direction and one going in the negative direction, but there's no more direction. Yeah, there's no more directions. You kind of, we're kind of out of, out of directions. And maybe some of you are like, really not okay with that. Hassan, what? Um, you see an example of this, that it has two horizontal Right, yeah, th this, one, this one has two. Can we have one with three, is the question. He says no, because we only have two directions to take limits at. Does that make you feel unsettled? Maybe. As far as I know, I, s I think I see a two-dimensional picture of you right now. But for all intents and purposes, you live in a more than two-dimensional world. <coughs> the cat's out of the bag, it's more than three, actually. So how many horizontal asymptotes can you have? <laughs> okay, well, well, we're not going to go there. Let's talk this one. Maybe you forget I even said that. In the plane, you can only have two, one, or zero. In the plane. Okay. All right. So what? Let's see. What? Uh, let's come up next. Great. We did that. We did that. Right. I think we're good with horizontal asymptotes. It's kind of you know, just a basic algorithm to do. You just go ahead and take these infinite limits. And in order to do that, you're plugging in bigger and bigger numbers, or more and more negative numbers. And you're looking to see if you get a constant number coming out. We're going to do some, some more examples of this uh, in a second. Um, but overall, this is OK. So now I'm going to throw a bunch of functions at you. and. We're going to find horizontal asymptotes. And I'm going to show you tricks for finding horizontal asymptotes. Okay, so this is sort of a kind of a theorem that's kind of uh, obvious. I would say for any function one over x to the r where r is bigger than Zero. The infinite limit as x goes to infinity of one over x to the r is. We saw a really good example of this just a second ago when r was one. Right. Is something very small. So if you take something really big and you take a root of it, you do get something smaller, right? But this, but roots as functions, do you remember their graphs? If I said, here's the rth root of x. At 0, it's 0. 
right? At one, it's one. Does it keep going up forever? The answer is yes. It keeps going up forever. If you, if, if I say, hey, give me the number which has the rth root equal to 100, you can tell me what that number is. It's going to be massive, depending on how small, how big r is. Like the hundredth root of some number is 100. That's going to be a massive number. But it, you do get there eventually. This graph, no matter what r is, keeps increasing in height. It just keeps going. Higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. If, you're, if you want to tell me that it stops somewhere, well then I will play the same game that I just said you could play. So if this keeps growing when you plug in bigger and bigger and bigger numbers, what does this do? Well, it's just like 1 over x. This gets smaller. Because you're taking 1 divided by something that keeps getting bigger and bigger. So this fraction keeps getting smaller and smaller, closer to 0. And that's true for any r, bigger than 0. divided by a polynomial, which is a ratio of polynomials, which we call a rational function. Okay. You know, if I gave you a number here, and it was in the domain of this rational function, what could you do to, e to evaluate it? You could just plug it in, because it's, it's rational functions are continuous on their domain. Okay. Infinity, not quite so. Infinity is not a number. We can't plug it in, but maybe we could consider what would happen with this theorem if we sort of thought about a way to plug it in. If we plug it in just straight away, sort of naively, what do we get up top? We get infinity squared, which is big. Huge, huge number is huger when you square it. This is also a big number, but it's less than this one because it's just x to the first. So this is basically like infinity on top. How about down here? Well, this is infinity squared, this is only taking away one infinity in the first. So this, this is basically this. So it's infinity kind of over infinity. If you want to think about it like in a naive way. So here's the trick. For any rational function, you can leverage this by factoring out the largest degree term. And you're going to get something that comes out that's really kind of nice. So this is the largest degree term, 7x squared up there. Down here, this is the largest degree term. We're going to factor those out. And we're going to see what happens. So we're going to take out 7x squared. You know what? Make it easier. Let me just, largest degree terms, 
uh, uh, x to the n, whatever that is, whatever n is. You don't actually need to take out the coefficient. You can. Makes it a little simpler maybe if we don't. So we're going to take out the x squared from up here and the x squared from down here. So what do we get? We get x squared. If we brought it back in, we would need the 7 there, right? 7x squared. Minus 2, because we would need the 2. We already have an x. So what do we need to put here so that when we multiply through, we get just an x here? x to the negative 1, or in this form, 1 over x. <coughs> Spot on. What about for the next one? We have a 1. What do we need to multiply this by so that when we multiply by x squared here, we get just 1? 1 over x squared. In the denominator, we factor out the x squared, and you're probably licking your lips already because you just want to cancel those out. We've got 14 minus 5 times 1 over x plus 1 times 1 over x squared. Same reasons as before. So here we go. If I see a factor of x squared on top, a factor of x squared on bottom. Gone. Just gone. Is that okay? Can we just do that? Maybe you can think about that for another time. It's okay. What are we left with? Well, we're left with this limit. 7 minus 2 over x plus 1 over x squared. Can you tell me the limit of each individual one of these things as x goes to infinity? 7 does not depend on x, so that's just 7. This has a limit of? This has a limit of? So you can tell me all of these limits. So you can tell me the limit of their sum or differences, right? By the limit laws. Okay, so that means you can tell me all of these, you can tell me the limit of the top function overall. Can you tell me the limit of this? No. 14. As x goes to infinity, 14. How about this? 5 over x. How about this? Okay, so you can tell me all these individual limits, which means by the limit law, we can say this limit is the limit, the quotient of the limits, and then we can distribute the limits throughout by the sum and difference law. Okay, this, is, this is important to remember. I've told you about this before. You can't just go taking limits wherever you want. I'm going to write these as this now, if that's okay. You do need to make sure that you can actually apply these laws before you start applying them. We know we can do that because we know we can find the limits of the top and bottom individually. So this equals this. We can find the limits of each of these guys individually, which means we can distribute the limit. That's the sum and difference law. Which means this limit overall is just 7 minus applying that theorem 0 plus applying the theorem 0 divided by 14 minus applying the theorem 0 plus applying the theorem 0. The limit of this rational function literally boils down to if you have leading terms with the same degree, the limit is just the ratio of the leading coefficients. 7 over 14, 1 half. What's the horizontal asymptotes of this guy? find the horizontal asymptotes, we take the positive infinite limit. And do we get a constant? Yes, we get a constant 1 half. 7 over 14. 
So if I say this, that's the horizontal aspect. It's a constant. It's not changing. It's not infinite. It's not negative infinite. Okay, so I, I want to like take a step back now and be more pensive about all of this right now. Because this was kind of two examples in one. How do you find limits of rational functions? You've got a trick. Factor out leading terms. Okay, That's, that, this is a huge trick that you can just do over and over again with any rational function. Factor out leading terms. In general, if the degree of the numerator equals the degree of the denominator, then the limit is the ratio of their leading coefficients, like we saw here. So like kind of as a general thing, no matter what polynomial I give you here or here, if the leading, if the leading terms have the same degree, like we have here, then you're going to factor out the same degree polynomial, and you're going to be left with the two constants here, and the limit is the ratio of those two constants. Those two constants are the leading coefficients for that. What if? Now have this case. They're not the same. On the bottom, we've got a cube. On top, we have the second. Intuitively, think about this. Which of these is bigger, the top or the bottom, if I plug in a, a number? The bottom is generally going to be bigger. Right? This is a positive thing. This is a positive thing. Squaring versus cubing. Well, cubes are bigger if you take big numbers. So what do you suspect this will go to? Zero. Very good. This is kind of a general idea. <coughs> if degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, then you're, you're going to have a zero limit. So let's work this out. We're going to take the largest term out, the largest uh, uh, x power out, x squared, 5 plus 1 over x squared. Okay. x cubed, 5 <coughs> minus. 1 over x cubed. Can we say that the limit of this quotient equals the quotient of the limits? Well, let's see. Can we find the limit of this thing individually and this thing individually? What's the limit of the top? As x goes to infinity, what's the limit of the top? Not 1. Big numbers, we square them, so we get bigger numbers. Multiply by 5, gets even bigger. Add 1, get a little bigger. Is there any limit to how big this number can be? No. 
because we can just plug in a bigger number if we want this thing to be bigger. So you can tell me that limit is infinity. Can you tell me the limit of the bottom? Infinity. Again, very good. For the same reason. I plug in a giant number, a big number, and x cubed is just bigger. Multiply by 5, it's, it's even bigger. Okay, it's a little less, but who cares how big 1 is when you're compared to like billions? So it's still massive. So there's no limit to how big I can make this denominator. Okay, so we can now say this is the quotient of the limits. And before we do that, we're actually going to cancel out these guys. So now this cancels with this. But this one isn't gone entirely. We're left with just one x there. We take two of those three, we remove them. So maybe I'll go like this. Take away two of them, we're left with just one. And now, since we knew we can find those individual limits, we can do this. And multiply it back here. 5x minus 1 over x squared. Okay, now individually, up here, can you tell me what the limit of 5 is? 5. It doesn't depend on x, so it doesn't change. Can you tell me what this limit is? 0. Good. Alright, so we could now take this as two separate limits in the sum because of that sum rule. And the limit of this overall would be 5. Can you tell me the limits of these guys individually? I think I heard it. This one's infinity. As x goes to infinity, 5 times x is just 5 infinities, which is still infinity. Just It grows without bound is the idea there. And then this one's zero. You can tell me the limits individually. So now we can di distribute this limit. It's the limit of this minus the limit of that. Infinity minus nothing is still nothing. So this is like a big air quotes here. We've got a limit of a constant divided by an infinite value. This is zero for the same reason 1 over x has a limit of zero. This number levels off, this limit levels off, and we can make this bottom as big as we want it to be. So if the degree of the numerator is like squared, and the denominator is like third or fourth, or even 2.1, so long as it's slightly bigger, But the limit is just zero overall. Okay, questions on that? <coughs> We're seeing the same trick sort of applied over and over again. I'm not going to uh, belabor the point too much. What's your guess for the last case? The denominators. Did I? Uh, yeah, I wrote this right. If the degree of the denominator is less than the degree of the numerator. So, a good example. compare the sizes of these two things, you've got now a cube divided by a squared. So this cube is bigger than this squared when you plug in big positive numbers. So eventually this thing goes to infinity, right? This one does. If I 
pull the same trick with factoring out x cubed. In fact, I'll just leave it at 2 for now. I can cancel these out. Take the limit. Well, now on bottom, this is, has a limit. It's 5. And the limit of the top is as big as we want it to be. by taking arbitrarily large numbers. So three cases here. But these were all limits as x goes to positive infinity. need to rehash certain situations when we have negative infinities. Yes, Can question. Yes. Okay, yes. Are you okay with the factoring out portion? Yes. Okay, and you're okay with the canceling portion? Okay. So the next thing we would do is ask, can we find the limits of every individual piece? If so, we can use all those limit laws. So, yes, infinity, zero. Yes, five, zero. You can find each individual limit. Right? We've got quotient of functions, and in each function we've got sums. Since we can find limits of every single piece, we can distribute this to everything. First, the top. next to the pieces. Okay, so on the bottom, on the top I'm actually going to leave it like this. Uh, that is a plus. No, we're good. On the bottom, easier just to write limits than to write in what you're taking limits of. It's a very bad habit. Um, probably won't kill you as fast as smoking, but uh, don't do it. Okay, so you're okay then with this so far? Okay, good. So now we can, you can tell me what several of these are. Right? This is just zero. This is just a constant, number 5, does not depend on x. When I pick a larger and larger number x, 5 is still 5, so that's that. And this is 0, same as that. Okay, so all of this now depends on one question. Can you make this number? 5x over 5 Can you make this as big as you want it? If I pick a bigger and bigger x, can I make this thing bigger and bigger? Yeah, right, so I say, you know um, Can you make this 500? You say yes, x is 100. Can you make this 5,000? Yes, x is a thousand. Five billion. Yes, x is one billion. If you take bigger and bigger numbers, you can make this bigger and bigger and bigger, which means this limit is infinite. You can make it as big as you want. Okay. Now divide it by five, which is what we have right there, right? The limit plus nothing divided by five minus nothing. Okay. Can you make this? 20. 
or can you make it like 100? Right? All you have to do is you have to pick the x that's big enough to make this big enough so that you divide it by 5 and you hit that number. If I ask you for making this um, a million, like the overall thing equal to a million, then what do you do? You plug in a million because you multiply by 5 and then divide by 5. So you get a million out. Well, can you make this, can you make this overall thing a billion? Yes, plug in a billion, and you get 5 billion divided by 5, which is 1 billion. So if you want this thing to be as big as you want it to be, you just need to plug in a big number, equal to the number you want it to be, which means you can make it as big as you want, because you can. there's no limit to the imagination for how large a number you can think of. Okay. Yeah? Okay. You seem a little uneasy right there. Like you're this is what I do. I'm a student. I know these things. If I don't really understand, this is what I do to the professor. He asks, or she asks, do you understand it? And I'm like, at the board only. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm there. I, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Good, good. Sometimes these things take a little bit to sink in. You have to do them yourself. You know, think through them. And, you know, in class, maybe you feel uneasy. Mathematics, physics, chemistry, all these like science-y classes, they kind of go against our very nature at times. We're not naturally born with a talent for calculus. We're not naturally born with an intuition for limits. We're not naturally born with an intuition for the speed an object is falling high after drop from a height of 2,000 feet. That initial velocity of six upwards, six months. Later. It takes a little bit of training. And during that training, we feel uncertain quite often. So math, physics, chemistry, learning in general is kind of this battle between uncertainty and your willpower. Anyway, I think for most of us, for all of us probably, I hope, it's just a matter of time until your willpower overcomes your uncertainty. Goodness, there are some really good examples in here. Some scary ones, but good ones. How challenged do you want to be today? On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being I can take on Newton himself. He was one of the authors of calculus, like original OG calculus, or Leibniz. I don't know. Who you prefer as your author? 10. Bring it on, Newton. Bring it on, Leibniz. One constant function, please. Zero now? No, that's <laughs> right now. There's zero, right there. That's it. That's it. Okay. Yeah, just walk out the, that opening right there. That's a zero. <laughs> please don't take zero. Four. Four? Okay, I got a four. Go for four. Five. Five. Ooh, it's. <laughs> Her willpower is overcoming your uncertainty right now. Okay, we'll go four and a half. There's only so many examples, so I mean, I can't really. Okay. We did that one. So if this is the easiest. Okay, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh wow, that's pretty fortunate that it's basically 10 examples. So I'll pick the fourth one after what we've done. One, two, three, four. Mm. Okay. Can I change the three? No, no, because three is worse. <laughs> three is arc tangent. Okay, evaluate. We did this one, so that's technically zero. So the door. Okay, one, two, three is arc tangent of one over x minus two. I'm not doing that one. Four is this one. Five is sine of x. The so five is like one. Okay, we're gonna do that one first. Okay, if you can 
tell me this in less than 10 seconds, you'll understand this completely. Ready? Go. Sine goes up and down forever and for always. It has this wonderful marriage with the interval negative one to one. It just keeps bouncing back and forth. No matter how big x becomes, this thing doesn't level off. It just keeps bouncing back and forth like a ping pong ball. That's five. Again, sine is like this. Here's infinity. It's still going like this. So, nothing. Okay. So five is really trivial. This one. The, uh... <sighs> student that's really been paying attention right away looks at this limit and says, wait a minute, what? Um, Maybe I made a typo. Yeah, like zero. She says, is that supposed to be zero? She says, we've been doing infinite limits all day. Uh, here's, a, here's another trick for the day. Thank you for picking this question, you all. You can translate limit things. Back and forth. You can translate infinities to zeros and zeros to infinities using this function 1 over x. Yeah. Yeah. What happens to 1 over x? Uh, hold on to that thought. Hold on. You're getting it. But what happens to 1 over x? as x goes to 0 from the left. Not infinity, negative, negative infinity. Oh. <coughs> 1 over x, so as x goes to 0 from the left, that means <coughs> negative numbers we're dividing by. 1 over x goes to negative infinity. How about the other direction, just, just for kicks and giggles? Positive infinity, very good. Which means we can rewrite this limit. This is totally a lot, by the way. Let's rewrite this. And let's rewrite this. X is now going to go to what? Negative infinity. And what are we replacing 1 over x with? We're going to just replace it with x. Sometimes it makes like, more sense to replace these things with different variable names. And the way to think of it is like this. What happens to y, which is 1 over x, as x goes to negative or 0 from the left? Well, y goes to negative infinity, right? So we want this to go to negative infinity. So what is 1 over x replaced with? It's replaced with y. This limit with this function is the same as this limit with this. What if I had asked this one? I'll get rid of that negative sign to make it easier. No. You don't care. We would change this to Same function here, going to infinity. We'll come back. To that. 
That's a fire alarm. Mm -hmm. See you all last time.